Hi, I'm Michael Tamlin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. Every year that we do this special Staff Picks episode, I say how it's special, and it's my favorite episode of the year. But this year is really special because I'm in our new studio at Kobo's new Toronto offices with my producer and co-host Nathan Maharaj, where we've already recorded episodes with incredible authors this year, and we'll be recording so many more in the future. And we'll be connecting with colleagues both in person and over Zoom to bring you an eclectic and diverse mix of outstanding reading recommendations. So let's get into the best books read by the Kobo staff in the past year. Can you tell us your name and what you do at Kobo? Hi, my name is Tara and I'm the director for Kobo Writing Life for English Language. And what is the best book you've read since the last time that we've uh, that we've done this? Well, so I usually pick a terribly boring nonfiction book, and I've decided to pivot this year as I delved into some different type of fiction um, that I didn't normally read. Um, so I have picked Elena Knows by uh, Claudia Pinheiro, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, um, and it's translated by Francis Riddle. First of all, I hardly reject the idea that any of the recommendations that you've given to us over the past years have been boring. Um, and they have been nonfiction, which is always a good thing. But tell us what it was about this book that grabbed you this year. Well, I was traveling to Argentina and I had never been there before. So as part of that, I wanted to read a lot of Argentinian authors and I was going through and there was a wealth I was delighted to find of of books to to choose from. Um, and this one, um, it was shortlisted for the International Booker Prize in 2022. I think it came out in 2021, the translation at least. Um, and it was sort of a short read, um, but it was kind of like a mystery, um, almost like... Um, I want to say like literary mystery sort of story. Um, mm -hmm. So it's called Elena Knows and it follows the protagonist who's name, who is Elena. Um, and she's an elderly woman that's suffering from Parkinson's and her daughter has died under what she thinks are mysterious circumstances. Um, so what I uh, liked about the book is that it's a one focus. Like I really like a movie that's almost like real time. You know, you travel along Um, the book is in mm -hmm. three different parts, morning, midday and afternoon as it follows her medication routine or schedule. Um, and she is kind of on a journey, shuffling herself through Buenos Aires to try and um, learn more about what actually happened to her daughter. And is this all happening in one day? Yeah. Oh, amazing. There's a lot of like flashback um to different things but it's all one day it follows along um and i like the idea of uh like an elderly lady being the protagonist because that's not something that you normally see um and it's quite sad she's very hunched over and she tells a lot of the story based on people's different shoes um so she, her viewpoint is is just to the ground and and walking through buenos aires as she's trying to go um to to meet somebody that she thinks can help unravel what actually happened to her daughter um, so yeah, it's, it was an interesting perspective. And you said that you, you encountered this book while getting ready for a trip. Um, how did you find out about it? What was the, uh, what was it that drew you to that particular title? Um, I think I probably, I probably just Googled my <laughs> best, <laughs> best, best fiction. Um, yeah. And then. And then after that, I, I did it the wrong way around, actually. Um, our colleague, um, Sylvia, who works on the Spanish books, I talked to her after I had read it, and she is a big fan of Claudia Pinheiro. So I should have gone for recommendations first and then afterwards. Um, but she's very, very well known in the sort of mystery field. Um, and it was my first time reading any of her work. And so would you recommend this book to someone who is more on the literary side, more on the mystery side? I think a bit of both. Um, like it's a very, I think I was uh, kind of reading up in it and people called it a, it's a bit of a claustrophobic read. So it sort of like takes you along with her. Um, the writing is really like you're, you're really full into the story, but then it is also a mystery that you're not too sure where you're going. There's a couple of red herrings and, and it, it ends. Um, I, I mean, I won't spoil the ending, but, um, yeah, it was, it was very moving. So a bit of both. So one more time, give us the title and the name of the author. The book is called Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro. And I read the translation by Francis Riddle. Thank you so much. Can you tell us your name and what you do at Kobo? Uh, my name is Rene Dantremont, and I'm the Senior Director of Communications here at Kobo. 
So what is the best book you read this year? All right. I was in a reading slump. And what got me out of the reading slump is The Drowning Woman by Robin Harding. She's a Canadian writer out of the West Coast. And I started reading her books about three or four back. And now I'm hooked. And so first of all, describe the nature of the reading slump. Like, had you just gotten into a kind of a cul-de-sac of reading the same book all the time or or just like lost interest altogether? I think just lost altogether. And usually what I do, I read a nonfiction and a fiction at the same time. I find it it adds variety. Mm -hmm. A lot of times nonfiction gets me out of a reading slump. And in this case, it was this mystery. So what what was it about this book that pulled you out? It was intense and high octane right from the beginning. And one of the major things you might think is a twist later on in a book happens right at the start. Okay. I, I, can you tell us anything about it without uh, without spoiling the uh, spoiling the plot? Absolutely. No spoilers here. Um, what happens is that there's a woman on a beach in her car, and she sees another woman drowning, goes to save her, realizes the woman was actually trying to pretend she was drowning to start a life over somewhere else. She was trying to disappear from um, an abusive relationship. Okay. So that's that happens right at the start. And then there's twists and turns all the way through. It is not boring ever. <laughs> and how did you find out about it? How did it get to you? Um, Robin Harding actually visited the Kobo office one time and I interviewed her for a podcast and I've been a fan ever since. And so then now that you've now that you've busted out of your uh, out of your reading rut like where is this taking you now? I really love this type of content whether they they be books or whether they be movies or TV shows and I can't wait to start seeing Robin's books turn to, um, into movies or TV. Um it, it's very reminiscent of the, the feeling you get of the vibe you get when you read it is uh, big little lies or um uh, White Lotus or anything or a- any mystery that Nicole Kidman stars in. That's the vibe <laughs> this book gives you. Excellent. So psychological twists and turns, lots of like lots of layers to get through and uh, and always a surprise at the end. Yes. And murder, of course. And murder, yeah. of course. The Drowning Woman by Robin Harding. Thanks so much. Thank you. My name is Tracy Nestle, and I am the Vice President of Marketing Communications, which means all the PR and social and so on that you could ever hope to see. And what is the best book you've read this year? Well, the best book I read this year is not a new one, I confess. It is A Perfect Spy by John Le Carre. And I have to tell you a little bit why I stumbled on this this year. Please do. So... I've always been told that Le Carre is an exceptional writer and that his books are super important and big and juicy and all of that. And I confess, I've seen Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, the movie, maybe four times, could not tell you, gun to head, what it is about. I feel maybe somebody's bad, someone dies, and there's a very glum guy named Smiley, and that is about all I got. So I've been avoiding it. But then when Le Carre died a few years ago, I sort of got into it. And then on the anniversary of his death, I was served this ad, you know how the internet works, saying that A Perfect Spy is the best novel since the Second World War, according to Philip Roth. So I thought, now's the time. That covers a lot of ground. (laughs) That covers a lot of ground. (laughs) And so then did you go into it thinking of it as as a spy story or did you think of it, did you go into it just looking at it as a novel, as a work of fiction? Because Philip Roth called it the best novel, I was looking at it as a novel and a novel it certainly is. And then did it just like change the way that you approached it as you as you cracked it open for the first time? Honestly, it is one of the most beautifully written books I've ever read sentences are stunning. Um, Le Carre's power of observation and his ability to share that in a in a really stop in your tracks profound way is kind of incredible. And then the story itself is so weirdly human 
in spite of the fact that there's almost no humans, like real people in the story, in that everyone is kind of suspect. Well, it's, it's very it's, good. Is kind of suspect and are isolated from each other and don't communicate with each other. Like it's it's all interior narratives with these tiny messages passed back and forth between people. Well, you know, what made it really interesting to me, I'm always fascinated by issues of morality or like I read crime novels because it always fascinates me. When do people choose to sin? You know, things like that. And in this book, it starts out, um, our, our main character, Magnus Pym, is no Magnus. Like one of the reasons why he's a perfect spy is he's so bland. Like he can, he can kind of fit into anything. And his, he's the son of a con man. So he's had to deal all his life with the notion that he's not actually loved. He's used when it, when it suits his father's purpose. And his father is charming and expressive and it's always a party near him and yet he cares for no one so from that perspective he's raised already to be a perfect spy and being a spy is is such an irony because you must vow absolute loyalty to your handler to your government to your country to some ideal and your job is to make people feel loyal to you with the purpose of betraying them and betraying that loyalty. And so once you've got that loose line, <laughs> stepping back and forth over it becomes relatively simple. And that's kind of the story we're taking on. And so does this mean you're now going to be going back into the Le Carre uh, back catalog to find more of these stories? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a very long list too. He's nice and prolific. Oh yeah. No, this is a, this is one of those like literary gifts that keep on giving. The book is A Perfect Spy by John Le Carre, and I promise you it's worth the trip. Can you tell us your name and what you do at Kobo? My name is Jacques Vio. I'm the senior copywriter for brand, creative, and product marketing. What was the book that really stuck with you this year? The one that stuck with me most is part of the Music Matters series. It's called Why Sinead O'Connor Matters by Alison McCabe. And Sinead O'Connor is someone who, um, you know, obviously in the news this year with her tragic passing, but is also someone that you have a connection to. And I'm wondering if you can tell me about that. I, I can. I'm... Um... I picked this book because I think anyone who knows me would tell you, of course I would. Um, I've been a lifelong fan since she first came on the scene in the late 80s and have always followed her career very, very closely. My collection of her work is a little off the charts. I have about 500 songs on my own personal playlist. Comprehensive. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I joined Twitter, actually, back in 2010, expressly to follow her. And and one night she was she was tweeting jokes about like um, making jokes about her own song titles. I can't mention any of those jokes on air for a family audience, but I, I joined in on that. And that actually led to uh, a long conversation and then a couple of years of, you know, the occasional email and or direct message sending each other memes and and that sort of thing. Um, she joined my LinkedIn. And eventually when she came to Toronto a couple of years later, um, texted me and asked, uh, she said she'd be in town the day before the show. Could I meet her in the band and go for dinner? So um, you never could have told me as a teenager that someday we would make this connection. And it's it's also the rarest of rare occasions of a parasocial relationship becoming an actual social relationship. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'm I'm really grateful it happened. She was in a a great space when I met her, and a lot of people say never meet your heroes, but for me, it was not that at all. Like we had a great time. And so, for someone who does not have maybe as encyclopedic a knowledge of Sinead O'Connor as you have, what is it about this book that makes it a good one to read to find out more about her? 
I think what's truly impressed me about the book is that Alison McCabe, to your point, unlike me, was like most people, like they knew of nothing compares to you. They knew that she tore up the Pope on Saturday Night Live, um, but never followed her really closely. And she became more interested in response to, Sinead had a, a very public breakdown in 2016. She recorded a video on YouTube in a lot of distress. And Alison McCabe saw online, she actually saw Fiona Apple's reaction to that. And that led her down a deeper dive of looking at Sinead's work and her history. And the book really draws a through line, like overlooks her career and her work and maps out exactly how she got to this space, um, which I found fascinating. And she also really connects it to uh, her own personal story. Like Alison McCabe had a very fraught relationship with her mother, as did Sinead. And the more she learned about her, the more she pieced together parts of her own story. And th there's a there's a moment where she gets a playlist sent to her from Sinead that like just cuts her in half because like the songs cut to the core of a lot of her own pain. So I, I thought it was really impressive that a music journalist after 35 years would would do the work. Whereas historically, a lot of music journalists are, are part and parcel of, of what happened to Sinead. Like the, the conversations were almost never centered around her albums or her artistry. They were always, they want to know about the Pope or about her hair, or about the fathers of her children or all this stuff that sort of distracted from great work that a lot of people don't know about. And when you picked this book up, was that what you thought you were getting into? Um, it was what I thought it was. I didn't expect so much of Allison's personal story, but I, I actually both read the book and then listened to it again after Sinead passed. I, I wanted to get a handle on both. Um, so it, it was kind of what I thought it was. And there was a lot of expected, unexpected bonuses because her research was so complete that she would link out to really old like Rolling Stone or Spin Magazine interviews. And if you're reading on a Kobo e-reader and you've got the pocket feature, it's just, oh, I'm going to save that for later. So, you know, my pocket archive has become like a, a really vintage collection of old articles and interviews um, with Sinead. So I was, I was really grateful for that, actually. Why Sinead O'Connor Matters by Allison McCabe. My name is Terrence. Uh, I'm currently the content coordinator on the team at Kobo Writing Life. So what is the best book that you've read this year? Oh man, this is always such a hard, <laughs> a hard question, but uh, I thought about it. And this year I've been reading a lot of Gothic and fantasy titles, sometimes with some crossover, like Gothic fantasy titles. So my pick this year is uh, a book called Orm Shadow by Priya Sharma. She's a UK based author. Uh, this book, it's a novella. It won the Shirley Jackson Novella Award and the British Fantasy Society Award, I think in 2019 and 2020, respectively. And um, yeah, oh my God, it was such an amazing read. It's a gothic family drama that takes place in the fictional town of Ormshadow, which is like somewhere on the coast of England. The, the family travels from Bath to go live at um, the family farm that um, is kind of in disrepair and is currently... Uh, under the control of a tyrannical patriarch, the brother of the main character's father. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a very dark, very grim coming of age story, but kind of woven throughout it is this story that the main character Gideon clings to about a dragon that is sleeping underneath this town. Um, and kind of throughout the book, you're like, is it a real dragon? Is it a metaphor for something? It's like one of those kind of stories. It's it's absolutely amazing. And um, I really liked the way that Sharma wove the dragon throughout the narrative. It's like a story about stories in a, in a way. And um, really in contrast to a lot of dragons in other fantasy gothic kind of uh, fiction, like I was thinking particularly, this isn't a gothic, but fantasy uh, in the terms of The Hobbit you know, the dragon Smaug, he's very scary. He's like an, mm -hmm. an emblem of terror, of greed. Uh, and in this book, the dragon is like the only thing that the main character has to cling to for hope, for guidance, for kind of comfort. Um, and yeah, it was just absolutely amazing story. It was only 130 pages. I read it in one sitting. So highly recommend anyone who wants to just sit like, you know, buy a candle in a darkened room, 
read a very, very good gothic, gothic fantasy novella. Yeah, highly recommend this one. Now, gothic is back. Oh, for sure. There are books <laughs> all over. The, there's like crumbling manor houses and yeah, crazy families locked up in, you know, in old rooms. What was it about this particular story that made it stand out from what's what's become a very crowded field in fiction right now? Honestly, I think it was the kind of fantastical or fantasy element because again i'm not going to give anything away there there is this key kind of character of the dragon um but i feel like you don't see that as often in gothic it's very as a lot of it can be very you know paranormal but it's it's often about the obviously the human element it's like the human Mm -hmm. aspect is what brings the goth what brings the horror um so in this one i just love that something that could be viewed as traditionally scary or threatening like a dragon was not um, and the fact that there is a dragon character, a dragon presence at all in a gothic gothic novel was also very unique, in, at least in my reading. I'm sure there's others <laughs> that have that kind of fantastical bent. And so would this be a good introduction to someone who hasn't read much in this genre? Yeah, I would say yes, especially because I, I as someone who loves classic gothics like Wuthering Heights, like Rebecca, they can often be quite intimidating because they're they're very, uh, very intense books, very lengthy in some cases. Um, so I think if you're someone who wants to get into the gothic, reading a novella like Orm Shadow is perfect because like I said, it's so short. It was 130 pages on my Kobo, um, like just the perfect kind of bite sized gothic fiction. <laughs> Snack sized gothic. Yes. <laughs> so one more time, tell us the name of the book. Sure. So it's Orm Shadow by Priya Sharma. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is awesome. Tell us your name and what you do at Kobo. I'm Kristen, and I am the acting manager for the campaign services. And tell us what the best book is that you read this year. Still Life by Sarah Winman um, was my favorite book this year. What was it about this book that really grabbed you? Yeah, so I was hooked by her prose, her storytelling. For me, for books that like really like grab me are ones where I'm like, I can see the characters. I feel like I'm in in the setting. And this one was very much that. So just like right from the beginning, you know, the characters are all these quirky kind of um, uh larger than life people that just like feel very relatable but also like you know you want to follow where they're going the settings were painted perfectly as in Italy which just like you know (laughs) being within Italy is just fantastic so I think it was just the combination of of the characters in the setting and then the, the story which was a great story as well almost felt a little bit secondary just because it was so well done um but the story itself was also beautiful and give us just a, like a little bit of what's you know what's going on at the beginning what is it that that grabs you when you start the book yeah totally so in this book here it starts off um during world war 2 um and so there there's this like chance encounter between this like soldier and this older woman um and they're talking about art um and then she, he he goes back to england where he's from and then through kind of a series of events he gets inherited um, some property within Italy and his new kind of life starts there. And there's this cast of characters that come with him from the pub in London or in England. Um, and they're kind of experiencing Italy and and they're all kind of, you know, they're, they're cast of characters. Like there's this older man who has a parrot with him, you know, they're just like experiencing life in Italy and, and in this small town and it's just so well done. And then there's a, you know, bit of a storyline happening with that original lady that he met in the beginning. And did this book turn out the way you thought it would when you when you first opened it up? No. So I didn't really have any expectations going into it. I'd just kind of seen the book. It looked really, you know, I'm, I'm generally intrigued by a, a pretty cover, but also if it's kind of a historical, um, you know, fiction type book. And so I'd actually bought it for my mother-in-law for Mother's Day, and then she raved about it. So I read it um, after, and it was just a really lovely book. And I, you're like me in the sense that I, you know, I get pulled in by a good cover. How often does the good cover as book selection criteria work out for you versus the times that it doesn't? Yeah, I would say like majority of the times, but there are some where I'm like, ah, 
this one wasn't this one isn't as good or the book cover was not very exciting and the book itself was amazing so I definitely don't choose my books by the cover but I am intrigued by a cover sometimes um, and I think this one had had a little bit of that and so who would you recommend this book to if you were going to put it in someone else's hands yeah, totally. So I think anyone who's interested in historical fiction, for sure. Um, if you're a fan of Kristen Hanna, Nightingale has similar vibes to it. Um, I would say if you're a fan of Donna Tart, just her story, um, her storytelling and, you know, the Goldfinch, it's very like, it's artsy uh, and it's intriguing. Um, this kind of has similar, like, sucks you in um, mm -hmm. aspect or Immor Immortals. He also does an amazing job. Um, with historical fiction and really just character driven and setting driven. And is this very much within your lane of the of the kinds of books that you pick up every day, or was this a step outside? No, this is very much within my lane. <laughs> I actually just finished her her other book, Tin Man, earlier this week, um, just because I was so intrigued by this one that she'd written, and yeah, very much in my lane. <laughs> Still Life by Sarah Winman. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Scott, and I am the team lead for business operations. What is the book that really stuck with you this year? Uh, the Rachel Incident by Caroline O'Donoghue. And what was it that got you? How, how did that become your best book? I love stories about friendship. I think that there are not enough stories about true like those star crossed we hear a lot about like star crossed lovers and all yeah. that i'm a big romance reader but what gets me even more is like a star crossed story about friendship so this book um takes place in like the late aughts in ireland it's about this girl who is working at a bookstore and she just so happens to befriend her colleague and they just kind of then set off on this like that really interesting time of adulthood when you've like just graduated you know graduated university and you're just kind of like figuring yourself out as an adult and you're like learning who you are out of the confines of like school and all that other stuff and just meeting somebody who just gets you on that like specific level is it's just something that just like really warms my heart and what's the mood are we talking thoughtful funny warm-hearted what's the what does it feel like it's a very thoughtful it's like it, I wouldn't call it a funny book, but it, there are funny parts. It's a very thoughtful book. It's a book that really makes you want to like reach out to your friends and just say like, I love you so much. <laughs> it's a very, and there's also some more like deeper um, subjects on it. So it does like touch on abortion. Obviously abortion in Ireland is not the most like <laughs> upbeat mm -hmm. topic. Um so there is a lot also about, you know, the links that you would go to for your friends and the people that like you love and care about. Um, but it's definitely one of those like warm books. And how did this book land in front of you? Um, I listened to a podcast and it was recommended on that podcast. And yeah. so far they've only ever <laughs> given 10 out of 10 recommendations. So Amazing. Yeah. And so who would you, if you were putting this uh, book in someone's hands, who would you give it to? Uh, if you loved Sally Rooney, it's definitely, and beyond the like Irish author of it all, I think Sally Rooney also writes to like a very specific time and like, again, that like adulthood growing up, mm -hmm. um, kind of like becoming like a person in the world. I would definitely recommend it to anybody who really like loved Sally Rooney's writing. Um, anyone who's kind of like trying, like bumbling their way through the world and feeling a little more grounded. And I think also there's something so special about the time that it was placed in because 2009 doesn't feel like that long ago but in a way it kind of was like when I think about how different... a lot of things have happened yeah yeah and so it was just like a really to see I was a little bit I wasn't in that like early adulthood stage when I read it but I it, everything felt just like so you know at time before like smartphones were so popular like the way that we interacted with it and connected with people was so different well and what you say is so true. We don't have a lot of books that are about that magic of friendship, mm -hmm. of, the, of the people that kind of pull you through your lives and who you, you know, you in turn kind of support and carry along. So uh, we need more of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So one more time, give us the name of the book and the name of the author. The name of the book is The Rachel Incident by Caroline O'Donoghue. Amazing. Thank Great. you. Thank you. I am Rachel. I am the promotion specialist for Kobo Writing Life. 
Uh, Kobo Writing Life is the self-publishing arm of Kobo. So I help get um, titles by indie authors in front of as many readers as possible. And I am also the co-host of the other Kobo podcast, the Kobo Writing Life podcast. Okay. And with so many books in front of you every day, what is the best book you have read this year? So uh, this kind of ties into the podcast. As a co-host of the podcast, I am really lucky that I get to read some books ahead of time. So I'm kind of cheating. This is my favorite read of 2023, but it doesn't come out until January 30th, 2024. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is like, we're, uh, we're building demand. Let's build those 2024 uh, TBR lists right now. Okay. But this was a book that like really spoke to me on many levels. And I was lucky enough to get to interview the author. Um, and it's Interesting Facts About Space by Emily Austin. And tell us all about it. It is a little bit of a weird one. Um, the like log line I would give is um, the main character, Enid, is obsessed about space. She has a phobia of bald men and she accidentally finds herself in her first ever long-term relationship. That's kind of the summary in a sentence. That's fantastic. And is that how it starts or is that what we get to? Um, that's kind of how it starts. The relationship portion kind of builds throughout the okay. beginning of the book, but right off the bat, you know that Enid loves space. She works for a nondescript space, space agency. You know she's scared of bald men, and you know she's a little bit anxious. And so in reading this book, um, did you immediately feel like, hey, this is like this other book of this other author that I've read, or does it really stand on its own? It really stands on its own. It reminds me of the author's other novel, which I feel like is kind of cheating when it comes to like books it reminds you of. No, totally fair. All right, perfect. Her other book is called Everyone in This Room Will Someday Be Dead. Very uplifting. And so who would you give this book to if you were recommending it to someone else? What would they have to like? Ooh, I would on, I would recommend it to anybody who likes to read um, books about really interesting and deeply flawed characters. Oh. And not flawed like morally, mm -hmm. just, you know, characters that are anywhere but perfect and are really working through whatever it is they need to work through. This book really touches on mental health and anxiety and also really touches on the intersection of queerness and mental health, which mm -hmm. I find fascinating, which is why I liked it so much. So I would definitely recommend this to anybody in your life who wants to read and is comfortable reading about anxiety or is a member of the queer community. And how would you describe the mood of it? Are we talking about something that's um, that's heartwarming, that's quirky? Is it sad? Is it funny? Like where, where does it hit on the emotional spectrum? It's definitely funny. Um, it's a book that takes kind of serious topics and doesn't necessarily make light of it, but makes you laugh because of just, you know, when something is so heavy, sometimes the best way to work through it is to laugh about it. So it's definitely funny. It's, for sure, quirky, and it has some really heavy moments, but it's dealt with uh, through humor. And how did you find out about the book in the first place? Well, I'm a big fan of the first book. I really loved um, okay. Everyone in the Will Someday Be Dead. And so when the KWL podcast was approached to get to read this book and talk to Emily Austin, I was pumped. The book is also all over my TikTok, so that also helped. So it, the perfect alignment of like work and enjoyment all, all at the same time. The perfect intersection of everything I love. Interesting Facts About Space by Emily Austin, hitting shelves January 30th, 2024. Can you tell us your name and what you do at Kobo? I'm Nimot, and I am the Acting Chief Technology Officer at Kobo. What is the book that really stuck with you this year? It is 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. What is it about it that, uh, that got its hooks into you? Well, I took the book uh, on my vacation to uh, Spain this year. And um, let's just say it was, it was a very thought-provoking book to read on warm nights uh, in the balcony sitting outside. Uh, pondering the many issues that he brings up. Um, 
yeah, does, when it gets you thinking, does it get you thinking in a happy way or in an, oh my God, we're all going to die way? <laughs> you can definitely take it to be very alarmist. Uh, all of the topics that he presents, presents challenges, and oftentimes he does not present an answer, um, which is why they are complicated questions. But I did not take it away as um, in that fashion. Mm -hmm. I just took it as complex problems that we as human beings are can't solve. Uh, the not challenges we have not met before, so to speak. And so, are these are these lessons in the sense of? here's something that I see going on in the world and this is what I extract from it? Or is it, here is a problem that's in front of us and you know, here are my thoughts on how we address it? It's a little bit of both. In some cases, he presents the problems as he sees it, brings his perspective and does not present a solution. He says, well, these are the ways in which we have been thinking about it, but they might not lead to a solution. And in other ways, in other places, he does say, we should be doing X, Y, and Z for us to solve these problems. And was there anything in it that really surprised you or that uh, that came out of left field that you weren't expecting? Um, I was just going over my highlights um, over the weekend. And one of the things that did uh, surprise me or I, 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 I wouldn't say surprise, it's the way he connected two different thoughts. Um, he was talking about AI, and he was also talking about dictatorships and how dictatorships uh, in his, um, uh, in the way he thinks about it anyways, led to failure because it relied on central decision-making. So centralized information, you just don't have enough power to make good decisions. And so you democratize information, you allow things to move independently, things move faster, better decisions come through it, which is a concept us as technologists really understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and what he warned us against is what AI allows you to do is to centralize all that information. The more information you centralize, the more powerful it gets, the better decisions it makes. And therein lies a danger if we don't, um, act on who owns data and what provenance do we have over it because it enables that particular uh, power to then become something um, you can't counter against. And I guess it also puts you in a place where as that information becomes centralized, you know, one set of algorithms or LLMs is interpreting it. That's right. Yeah. So you don't get that cross pollination and challenging of ideas. That, that's exactly it. Yeah. How did this, how did you find this book? Uh, that is a good question. I think it was one of my recommendations. I have read his other two books, Homo Deus and Sapiens, and it was there in one of my recommendations. And uh, yeah, I just happened to pick it up. All right. The system works. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. If you were handing this book to someone, who would you give it to? I would give it to anybody who is who are interested in cultural anthropology. Those two terms seem to mean something big, but just understanding ideas and things that are coming together. It was... Um, from many different directions and connecting various lines of thought. So it's not just about AI, but how that affects liberty, how that affects um, terrorism, how that affects war, how that affects nations, um, and how all of these ideas interweave to uh, ultimately emerge as what we uh, experience in society. And is it enough in his style that it's safe to say that if you liked Sapiens, you will like this book as well? Yes, absolutely. 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. Um, hello, I am Jessica Kadu, and I am the original content manager in English language. So tell me, what is the best book you've read this year? The best book, without a doubt, is Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. 
Okay, this sounds very definitive. So why this book? What makes it so great? So for me, I've been slowly trying to get into the fantasy romance genre. It's been taking me some time. It's my attention span kind of wanes with the immense world building. Right. So this book in particular just handles it so well that it doesn't inundate you with like all of this world building and droning on for pages and pages. It, Rebecca Ross just has this ability to capture you, tell you the details you need to know in that particular moment, which just makes it actually have so much more weight to it and makes you respect it so much. I, there's so much I can say about this book, but honestly, it's just beautifully written and enthralling from the first page. So what would you normally be reading before this like th this sort of sudden move into into fantasy? Uh normally I'm a contemporary fiction fan, romance um or going the complete other way and going non-fiction and memoir. So by the nature of my work but also just seeing the hype over fantasy romance and how so many people have just fallen in love with the subgenre, I've been really trying to give it a chance. So give me one thing about this book that really grabbed you. The tension between the two main characters, it's Iris Winnow and um, Kit, Roman Kit, his name is, uh, they start off as work rivals, actually. They work for a newspaper, uh, the Oath Gazette, and they are competing for the lead columnist role. And that's basically how it starts off. And then throughout the book, you just see their lives intertwine in multiple ways. There's lots of magic realism happening. And then they seem to be connected by this very mysterious um, typewriter. And just between the two of them, uh, there's a lot of misconception. There's a lot of uh, I don't know, just chemistry back and forth. A lot of them, you know, just snipping at each other. And that really builds a really great sort of foundation for the romance that happens. Okay. So we have like rivals to lovers. Yes. But we've got an overlay of magic to it. Yes. We have like the good quippy, you know, banter, banter. happening. Okay. And did you find as a as a kind of contemporary fiction reader, does the magic add to it or did you have to kind of look past it? The magic adds. So the basis of the story really is Iris is driven to look for her brother who we meet in the first sort of prologue of this book and he is going off to war. So we find out initially that there is a war between gods happening in distant lands and people are being called uh, to come and fight. But where Iris is from, they are so distant that it's not really too much a concern for them and they're not really paying attention. But Iris is just obsessed with finding her brother. And it's it's just, um, I don't know, just the way that she can wrote the story and the way that she grabbed you from the beginning, you're really just invested in Iris as a character is so sweet, but also driven and you're really rooting for her. So to make this jump into a new genre that you hadn't previously been in before, how did you find this book? How did you know this was the right one to start with? Um, I started, as I perused through Goodreads, I started seeing it pop up really everywhere. And the ratings and reviews for it were sort of through the roof. It was like upwards of a 4.3 star for uh, you know over 100,000 yep. reviews. It was crazy. So I was like, okay, I got to try it. And um I was really happy I did. I actually listened to this in audiobook and the narration was perfection. And does this mean then you're going to kind of continue on into this uh you know into this reading genre? Uh yes, I will and good news is that Divine Rivals actually is part of a duet. So the second book is going to be coming out on uh Boxing Day this year. So very excited for that. So one more time, give us the name of the book and the name of the author. Okay, and the book is Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us your name and what you do at Kobo? Uh, my name is Nathan Maharaj. Um, I am the director of content marketing. I also um, 
your I'm your co-host on this show. Uh, co-host is weird. We're never on the show together. Um, I think is this is like the one of the rare times when when both of us are you know same mic, same track, same day. So this is very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Usually our voices don't even appear on the same episode, so it's rare. Um, yeah. So I, I uh, yeah, I'm your co. I produce the show. I will be editing this later. Um, and um, uh, and I uh, I have a I have a book to tell you all about. Okay, lay it on me. So this was, oh God, it's really hard. It's, it's, it's hard picking good books and, and it's, it's hard doing it when you work on this show because we, we, we like, we're picking favorites all year long and then chasing down the authors to talk with them about it. So like, I loved Naomi Klein's book, um, Doppelganger. I thought it was, was incredible, but that's, that was like, is that it? I don't know. John Valiant's book was really upsetting and it's going to stay with me a long time. Um, Oh, God, like we but was we, also great and impactful. But we great. got that. We got yeah. it on tape. We got it all. Yeah. Um, and and I'm realizing like, no, the the one the one that I actually need to go back to because I'm not a rereader. And the one that makes me think I've missed something and I need to reread it is Kai Thomas's novel in the upper country. I talked to Kai in I think I talked to him in December. I think I talked to him a year ago. Uh, but the episode went out um January of this year. So this book has stayed with me a long, long time. And it's it's a it's a work of historical fiction. It takes place in a fictional town called Dunmore, which is essentially the end of the line of the Underground Railroad. This is a, a place in southern Ontario um, that that is that where where um uh enslaved people are are um smuggled uh away beyond the reach uh the the legal reach of of slavery um and uh and so it's this town um occupied by people who who have escaped the, the southern united states and and are uh, formerly enslaved and it's 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 that it's a window into that little um bit of culture that this town that shares knowledge of this violence of this past um and but also shares shares what what they're sharing now they share their present um it focuses on on a writer lincinda um uh she she writes for a newspaper called the colored canadian and it's a newspaper that reminds us how scrappy and random newspapers used to be like this newspaper is run by a lady named arabella she is a very particular kind of person with a very particular kind of worldview, and uh, and that's why she she enlists uh, Lincinda to um, uh, to write for it. Um, it's based on some real stuff, uh, but it's it's essentially um, uh, an, an invention um, from from the mind of of Kai Thomas. And so, you did this interview, you know, kind of more than a year ago now. What is it that stuck with you? And what do you feel like you haven't quite extracted from it yet that makes you want to go back to it? I think I was I was well into it before I realized that he was operating on on a level. Uh, actually, it reminds me of another person we talked to this year, David Grant, who was who was saying that like uh, one of the principles of writing his nonfiction thrillers is like in in retrospect uh, the history all makes sense, but in the moment for the people experiencing it, it's bewildering. Um, mm -hmm. and Kai Thomas in writing this really tries to, I think, get you into this world, um, that is, that does not share our politics, that does not share our historical reference points because it is setting those reference points. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, characters are not, you know, they're not coded by identity on a, along a moral compass. And it was a thing I realized I was well into it before I realized he was operating on a level where I, anything I thought I've learned by using my contemporary moral compass, I, I in fact haven't. In fact, I've been missing things. And it made me think I need to go, I need to go, I need to go back and go over this. Um, because it's, it's, it was, I wasn't prepared for somebody operating like, you know, Cormac McCarthy. Mm -hmm. I thought I was just reading a good, literary historical novel and and i was i was well into it and that before i realized in fact it was great and i and i and i owed it more and so you know we live in a time that feels uncertain with political turmoil with social upheaval we're used to looking into the past for certainty that it seems like the events of history are you know plotted along this sort of arc of inevitability 
does does that sense of the turmoil that was happening at that time give you a kind of give you a different context for how you're feeling today it 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 helps me loosen my grip a little bit on some things um some things i i believe to be true uh you know even moral principles of like and you can't like you know go through life without any principles but it does it does allow me to uh to approach things a little bit more with a little more curious, uh, with a little more curiosity than, um, maybe, um, confrontation. Um, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm more apt to listen and consider and continue to formulate my point of view rather than expressing it in response, almost reflexively to, Mm -hmm. to whatever's been, been put in front of me. Um, because this book is very much not doing anything reflexively it's very deliberate um if you listen to kai talk in our interview he 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 picks every word um like it's costing him something um and and you know and it's worth it i think even then he's undervaluing everything he has to say because he's he's quite brilliant and so if we ran this through the you know if you like this you'll also like this algorithm what's what are other books that you would put beside this one um I would contrast it with something like, um, you know, another brilliant writer who, who attacks uh, similar historical matter from a completely different angle. I think it would make an interesting juxtaposition against Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad, uh, where, where, I he, thought you were where he literally yeah. spells out a railroad. But it would also read um, really well against, you know, Blood Meridian uh, by Cormac McCarthy. OK, um, uh, maybe all the pretty horses, uh, because because I think he's I think he's working at that level of of kind of uh uh he's he's been he's been able to do a thing that's really interesting in our day and age of like extracting assumptions about safety and and institutions and laws and things like so you're at the end of an end of the underground railroad when the bounty hunter uh, when the bounty hunter comes what's stopping him he has a mission he's been paid what's going to stop him you you can't say but 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 this there's is a Canada. Border. Yeah. Yeah. Like who, who, who exactly um, is going to stop it? So it's that, that thing that Cormac McCarthy does of like every scene is about violence, even when no one's, no one's getting hurt. So one more time, the title and the author in the upper country by Kai Thomas. Fantastic. I always come out of this recording session with so many new additions to my to-be-read pile, and I hope that you did too. You'll find all of the books mentioned here at Kobo.com slash conversation and through the link in the show notes. We'll be back soon with more author interviews, but in the meantime, you could always dive in to the Kobo and Conversation archive. Earlier this year, we crossed the 100-episode mark, and it was either the one that I did with John Valiant or the one that Nathan did with Tom Rackman. It depends on whether we're counting Encore episodes or not. Either way, all of our episodes are available in your podcast player of choice or on YouTube, and wherever you find us, we hope you'll subscribe. Happy reading, and thank you for listening.